figures and really with the topics that we're doing today, um, and our speaker probably could have spoken on almost every, every panel, um, if not every um, individual, which is a remarkable um, situation to be in. Um, two books I just wanted to um, um, focus on um, in particular for um, Professor H.W. Brands and his, his book on Theodore Roosevelt, which um, I think is a, is a real classic and a, a wonderful biography of um, Theodore Roosevelt. And then the other book which um, had a major influence on me was his book, What America Owes the World, which is a short book on some of these debates on um, intellectuals and American foreign policy. So I can't think of a better speaker to talk to us today. Um, I um, would like to introduce to you Professor H.W. Brands. Jack S. Manton, Chair in History here at the University of Texas, Austin, to speak to us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie, for that kind introduction. Thank you for organizing this event. Thank you, to Will, the Clement Center, for bringing us all together. You know, Charlie, I was going to speak on Harry Truman. So we had a conversation not that long ago. And you said that you had been influenced by my book, What America Owes the World. I hadn't thought about the book for a long time. But I thought, okay, well, I so I actually did propose an argument. Most of my books don't really propose that much of an argument. This this book did. And I thought, well, if it influenced you, uh, it didn't influence very many other people. <laughs> it mentions it to me. But I thought, okay, well, I'll try it out again, give it another try. And I have to say that when I follow a people like Strigo like Henry Now. I'm always a little bit intimidated because political scientists have this orderly way of approaching things. And when Henry presented the taxonomy of views on foreign policy, so we get to deal with the, the realists and the constructivists and the liberal internationalists, and now we got the conservative internationalists to deal with, and nationalists and all these other things. I thought, okay, well, this is very interesting. And without without any disrespect to any of those ways of categorizing things. I'm going to propose a new taxonomy. You need some more categories. And this, be, not because any of these existing ones are lacking in any particular way, but because sometimes a different perspective is helpful. And so I'm going to, going to give you three propositions today, or three, uh, three observations, perhaps. And the first is that to understand American foreign policy, you have to understand American domestic politics. Because perhaps more than in most other countries, foreign policy grows out of domestic politics here. And in order to understand American domestic politics, you need to understand this thing called American exceptionalism. Now, it is a much derided term. And it is one that doesn't get a very, shall I say, respected hearing in a lot of circles. It's something, however, that has been with us for a long time. And it really, I think, characterizes both American domestic politics, but especially American foreign policy. And it basically is this idea that America means something. And it means something that is different than what other countries mean. In fact, I really don't know enough about the history of, every, of lots of other countries to be able to say whether other countries sort of have this sense of meaning, that their country has to mean something, especially with respect to the rest of the world. But in American history, you see it from the very beginning, from when John Winthrop planted his city on a hill. It was going to be an example to the rest of the world. When Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, that they talked about these are the rights of, of all people and not just Americans. When Abraham Lincoln, in his Gettysburg Address, says this is about whether government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall perish not simply from the United States or North America, but from the earth. And you know it gets us up to Woodrow Wilson about making the world safe for democracy and Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedoms and George H.W. Bush's New World Order. America has always had this idea that this country has to stand for something. And again, I'm not going to say that this is unique among countries, but I would say that it does characterize the American attitude toward the world. Now, I think there's a deep and underlying reason why this is true. 
Because other countries, most other countries, let's say most other countries outside the Western Hemisphere, countries that are not sort of settler immigrant countries, can identify themselves as coming from a common source. There's this homeland. So there's a German homeland, there's a Russian homeland, there's a Spanish homeland, a French homeland. In America, there's, for most people, because nearly everybody here came from somewhere else, or their ancestors did, there's not this common land of origin. There's not a common language, there's not a shared history, there's not a shared religion. So the one thing that they share is this idea that America is this land of opportunity, America is this place that means something to the rest of the world. So, oh, another aspect of this is that the United States was born in the Enlightenment. And it was the creation of, the self-conscious creation of a set of people in the late 18th century. And so this is the modern United States. This is what this country stands for. I would add that Americans had some explaining to do regarding what this country meant because from the very beginning, this country was in essence an empire. Americans were spreading from the east coast of North America across the continent. And they always had to explain to themselves, perhaps more than anybody else, why they were able to displace the native peoples, why they were able to seize this land. There had to be a higher purpose for all of this. So I think there are a couple of consequences of this. One is that American attitudes toward the world and toward foreign policy often sound a lot like the attitudes of empires. So when the French spoke of their civilizing mission, when the Spanish spoke of the basis of their empires being for the greater glory of God, so that was the notion. Those were always outward-looking notions of foreign policy. The United States has had that from the beginning. And one of the consequences of this is that in the United States, at least until now, there has been nothing like a narrowly nationalist foreign policy. There has, there's a period of American nationalism, but the nationalism of the 19th century was a nation-building kind of nationalism. It wasn't a xenophobic, exclusive nationalism. In fact, the time of the greatest nationalism in American foreign policy, American politics, was also a time of the largest immigration. So the nationalism in American history is this nation, we build up the nation and by which people meant we, we add territory, but we also create the institutions of government. Anyway, so the first proposition is American exceptionalism is something we have to pay close attention to in trying to understand American foreign policy. And this over the long term. So I'm going from the 18th century to the 21st century. Now, so that's proposition one. Proposition two is that this this attitude, this idea of exceptionalism, what does America mean, took, has taken two forms primarily, historically. And these are two outlooks on the world <laughs> that I identified in the book that Charlie mentioned and that I came up with labels for that apparently were not very good labels because nobody else picked them up. But basically, they're based on two ideas. One is, one version of this American exceptionalism and America's sort of role in the world is what I call the exemplarist view. That the meaning of the United States is to create an example of a thriving, functioning, prosperous democracy. And if America sets the example for other countries, for other peoples, that will be enough. It will perhaps change the world, and maybe over the long term it will change the world most effectively. But if the United States goes beyond that, goes beyond just setting an example to try to compel other people to be, other countries to be more like the United States, then there is a strong risk that America will lose its democratic soul at home. Now, those of you who know the history of American foreign policy will know that the best articulator of this view is John Quincy Adams. And Quincy Adams was one who on the 45th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, at a time when people like Henry Clay were arguing in favor of American support for revolutions in Latin America, when people like Daniel Webster were saying that the United States needed to provide support to revolutionaries in Greece, that when people were saying that the United States needed to assist the emergence of republics around the world, 
Adams rejected the view, at least if it meant that the support was going to be anything more than moral support. And the speech is often quoted, but there are a few lines that are worth repeating. Speaking of America, Adams says, she is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. She is the champion and vindicator only of her own. She might become the, dictate, the dictatress of the world. She would no longer be the ruler of her own spirit. So, I'm calling this the exemplarist approach to American foreign policy. And I would say that this approach characterizes the United States from the 18th century to the beginning of the 20th century. And so, you see it in Washington's farewell address, where he talks about avoiding permanent alliances. Thomas Jefferson says don't get in entangling alliances. The Monroe Doctrine, which John Quincy had basically authored, was basically a statement that the United States was going to keep its hands off of European affairs. It eventually would mean that the United States would claim for itself a sphere of influence in the Western Hemisphere, but, for the, but initially it was this self-denying approach to what was going on in Europe. It was Adams's answer to Daniel Webster and Henry Clay saying we need to support the Greek rebels against Ottoman rule. It was, in its way, the, the theory, the, the philosophy behind Manifest Destiny. Now that might sound a little bit odd, because Manifest Destiny was this aggressive approach to expansion. Except that the philosophy of Manifest Destiny was this idea that the United States was going to spread its values across North America, and perhaps even beyond that. And in fact, you know, one of the tests of this is that Manifest Destiny emerges in its most striking form during the 1840s, amid the war with Mexico, which is often seen as an example of American continentalism. So we're going to spread all across North America. But in fact, the, the really interesting result of the war with Mexico was not how much the United States expanded, but how little the United States expanded. Because the continentalists of the 1840s, they were thinking the Arctic Ocean to Panama. And in fact, where are we today? We're just sort of that middle third. The United States could have annexed all of Mexico, but it didn't. And the principal reason that the United States did not annex all of Mexico was, I mean, one could put it sort of negatively, uh, too many Mexicans. I mean, that's one version, but in, in essence, that's behind it. Because the territories of Mexico that the United States annexed were largely unpopulated. Yeah, there were some native tribes, but there weren't very many Mexicans there. And the United States did, did, deliberately did not take those portions of Mexico where there were lots of Mexicans because of the idea that democracy does not impose itself on other people. Anyway, so one of the schools of American foreign policy is this exemplar school. The other school is the one that Adams advised Americans not to get into, and that is, I mean, he used the term the vindicator only of our own. So I call the second school the vindicator, the school of vindicators. And so we've got this distinction between those who say that America's influence on the world, the, the debt that America owes the world, can be discharged by simply setting a good example. That's one category. The other category is those who say, no, in fact, the good example needs to be augmented by American force. And this is something that emerges about the beginning of the 20th century. And one can see that when Theodore Roosevelt proposes his corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, where he talks about the United States being this police power. Policemen don't simply set a good example. They go around with a billy club, they go around armed. And the kind of a, the cusp here the inflection point is probably the Spanish-American War, which, in fact, originates out of this idea that the suffering Cuban people need the help of the United States. And it's going to take more than simply a good example to get the Spanish to release their hold on Cuba. And when we get into the 20th century, so basically, the exemplarist school governs during the... 19th century, 18th and 19th century. The Vindicators take over in the early 20th century. Theodore Roosevelt is one who believes that democracy needs to go armed. Woodrow Wilson contends that the world has to be made safe for democracy. 
Democracy can't stand aside and simply shed the light of its good example in the world. Democracy has to be defended. And you can continue this sort of right up through the 20th century. Franklin Roosevelt, the Truman Doctrine. The Truman Doctrine is a good example that the United States is going to have to defend democracy, defend American principles around the world. So, we got the exemplarist century is the 19th century, the vindicator century is the 20th century. Now, the title of my talk is, it was Values, Interests, and American Exceptionalism. So, I've checked off the exceptionalism, now, the values and the interests, okay? This actually dovetails with what I was just talking about. Because one could make an argument, and so, so briefly, you know, those people believe that the most important aspect of American po foreign policy is to preserve and extend American value. And there are others who speak in terms of American interests, usually referring to some kind of material or national security interests. And I would contend that those overlap fairly neatly with the exemplarists who are focusing on values. And they believe that values, the values that are most important, are values that cannot be imposed. That, well, I mean, they would put it that you can't install democracy, lasting democracy, at the barrel of a gun. Now, we could argue about this, and there are counterexamples to this, but nonetheless, that's the basic approach. The vindicators would contend that's going to take too long, or that there are dangers out there that need to be dealt with right away. And so, fine. If, we, if the rest of the world wants to wind up looking like us, but what if there are real bad actors on the world scene? What do you do with Hitler? Okay, and so the answer is, well, you deal with that. Anyway, so I would contend that the, the values and the interests, they, they map onto the exemplarist and the vindicators. But I would say that also, as just as there is, well, there's overlap between these schools. And so at no time is one entirely predominant, and the other one entirely absent. But I would suggest that the distinction between values and interests is a matter of degree rather than a matter of kind. And I would say that, and, okay, and I would say, for example, that values are things that you attempt to accomplish over the long term, and interests tend to be more short term. Um, Values are things that you can promote by example. Interests are those things that you have to defend or promote by force. Values and the exemplar school is about persuading people, whereas the vindicators believe that you can use coercion. And at a more fundamental level than this, the the exemplarists are sort of at their core liberals. And they, in the, in the following sense, that liberals, for my purpose, are those people who believe that the world is changeable, that humans can improve, that institutions can get better. And so you are a liberal if you believe that, given the right circumstances, given the right context, that people, individuals can get better, that individuals be, can become more peaceful, become more prosperous, education matters, against conservatives who tend to think they take a rather narrower view of human nature and that if we can simply make it through today without getting mugged, then things will, that's about all we can expect, who believe that it is naive to aim for a future utopia will deal with the world as it exists. Okay, so, proposition one was exceptionalism is in America's DNA. Proposition two is that there are these two ways of looking at things, the vindicators and the exemplars. And the third, my third proposition is one that, well, it sort of explains why we went from the exemplarist approach to in the 19th century, to the vindicators approach in the 20th century, and where we're going in the 21st century. And this has to do with something that I, uh, I immodestly call Brands' second law of history. <laughs> now, I tell my students that there, that there is this body of what I call Brands' laws of history. And I explain that it's not because I'm particularly proud of these laws. I want them to know that there, in fact, 
Brands' first law is that there are no laws of history. <laughs> and so I don't want them to walk away from my classes thinking that there are these laws of history that other historians would agree with. No, no, these are just my own idiosyncratic take on things. And so anyway, Brands' first law is that there are no laws. However, there's each one has a little codicil after. There are no laws, but there are tendencies. So it is worthwhile to pay attention to what happens in the world. Brands' second law goes this way. It says, sooner or later, every country gets the foreign policy it can afford. And I explained that. This is, I won't call it exactly a Marxist view, but it is a view that stresses the role of economic resources and the material wherewithal to accomplish things in the world. And basically, poor countries have modest foreign policies. Rich countries have ambitious, assertive, even aggressive foreign policies. And this is almost regardless of the nature of the regime, the ideology of the country. Think of it this way, that if you are a poor country, if this applies to individuals as well, if you're a poor individual, you sort of accept the world the way it is and make the best you can of it. If you are wealthy, then you think you can, certainly it's worth trying to change your world. And if you're a rich country, instead of thinking that, okay, terrorism, speaking of the 21st century, terrorism is a fact of modern life. So we have to prepare to defend ourselves against terrorist attack. That, if you're Belgium, okay, that's the, basically the only approach you can take. If you're the United States, however, you can say, you know what? We can deal with terrorism by rearranging the affairs of the Middle East. And we can send troops to the Middle East, and we can fight as long as it's necessary to defeat those people who are going to attack us from abroad. In some ways, in some ways, foreign policy is an insurance policy. And poor people, they don't have insurance. You just live with the vicissitudes of life. Rich people, they buy home insurance, they buy flood insurance, they buy health insurance. You can attempt to insure yourself against the strange things that might happen in life. And this is what foreign policies are about. And if you are wealthy enough, then you can have a foreign policy that attempts to change the world rather than simply deal with the world as it exists. So, the underlying argument is that countries get the foreign policy they can afford. But the initial clause, like the initial clause of the Second Amendment, has important meaning. Except in my case, we know what, at least I'm going to tell you, what that initial clause means. So the sooner or later part, it means that there is often a time lag between when countries can afford an ambitious foreign policy and when they actually put it into effect. And I would say also between when countries can no longer afford an ambitious foreign policy and when they acknowledge that they can no longer afford it. So for example, the United States by 1900, sort of roughly speaking by most estimates, had the most powerful economy in the world. It was the richest country in the world by 1900. And if it, not for that sooner or later part to this so-called second law, the United States should have had the most ambitious foreign policy in the world, but it didn't. And it didn't have that ambitious foreign policy because, well, there's this time lag. There were these expectations. And in fact, if you think of the way sort of people are educated and come to positions of power, by the time you become president, let's say, if you're, we're talking about presidents, you are typically in your 50s or maybe older, which means that you were educated four decades or so, three or four decades before the time you take office. People who became leaders of the United States in the first half of the 20th century, let's say until, oh, just pick an arbitrary date, Pearl Harbor, okay? Until that time, they were educated in the 19th century. They grew up at a time when the United States was not the most powerful country in the world economically, and when the United States did not have the ambitions that it would come to have. Sometimes, very often, human nature, a jolt, an external jolt has to take place to get people to change their minds, and Pearl Harbor provides that. And so, the United States from 1940, 1941, until the present, has had the most ambitious foreign policy in the world, and quite arguably, arguably the most ambitious foreign policy in world history. You know, never has any country tried to 
assert its will in so many parts of the world for so long as the United States. So, there's a time lag on the upside. There is a time lag on the downside as well. And on the downside, a good example of this is Britain. So the British had a very ambitious foreign policy through, during the heyday of the British Empire into the 19th century. And they kept thinking they could have or should have or would have a very ambitious foreign policy even through World War II. I mean, World War I weakened them badly. World War II bankrupted them. But it took until something like the Suez Crisis of 1956 to get the British to realize, sorry, you can no longer do what you once did. And it was a trauma for those people who had grown up during the earlier era, but the British got used to it, and then British sort of plays in the, the second league of world powers now, and that's just the way it is. So, so I've explained, perhaps not to your satisfaction, but to mine. <laughs> American foreign policy in the 19th century, the 20th century, where do we go to the 21st century? Okay, well, so, oh, I guess I should add, though, that in American history, the exemplarist approach is the approach of, I could use the term, the approach of the weak, or you could say it's the approach of the poor. When the United States could not afford that ambitious foreign policy to wield the sword of the vindicator, to change the world, Americans contented themselves with this idea, we do mean something to the world. And what we mean is this beneficent example. We will show the world how to be democratic. Just take just one aspect of it. In the 20th century, when the United States had the resources to go beyond that, then it was tempting. In fact, it was irresistible. Americans could not still say, no, we're simply going to set a good example. There were those who attempted it during the interwar period, and Robert Taft was kind of late to come around in the period right after World War II, but eventually, if you can, you will. And that is the essence of Brand's second law. So now we're into the 21st century. And what does this tell us will happen? Well, in the first place, I'm merely a historian rather than a social scientist. And we historians, we usually know well enough not to predict the future. But we don't always know well enough, so I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. It's Friday in Austin. Go ahead. There we go. And that is, and that is, the United States no longer has the lead over the rest of the world economically that it had when all this started in the 1940s. So in the 1940s, the United States had basically 50% of the world's industrial GDP. You know, by now, it's down in the low 20s, or maybe 20%, which means that there are other countries out there. There are other countries, depending how you measure things and what you call a country, the GDP of China is quite comparable to that of the United States. The GDP of the EU, I don't know if we count it as a country, does the EU have a foreign policy? It's larger than the United States. And, you know, where will it be after Britain leaves? Anyway, my point is that there is no longer a single country in the United States that dominates world economic affairs the way the United States did during the 20th century. And so, I think I'm going to predict that we are going to revert to a period that is more likely exemplarist 19th century than the vindicationist 20th century. And it's going to work out this way. Americans, I did, some of you will remember when the Social Security Administration every year would send out your statement of account. It certainly looked like a statement of account. And it said that over your working life, you've contributed this much money. And when you retire, other things being equal, if the trends continue, we'll get, you'll get this much. And if you read that, you really had the strong impression that there is this much money waiting for me in Washington when I retire. <laughs> now, in fact, it was an accounting fiction. There was no such thing, but it certainly looked like the real deal. And generations of Americans have grown up with this idea. And what is it that they call them? Entitlements. Okay? I'm entitled to that. I paid for it and I ought to get it back. Now, I think that it was a PR failing of the Pentagon that it never sent out something similar. Because I never got a statement of account from the Department of Defense saying, you've got this much defense coming to you. And so, when the budget gets pinched, as it has been getting pinched, for the last, basically, since the Reagan years, but it's going to get increasingly that way, people are going to have to make decisions. I'd go so far as to say that American foreign policy, 
We, the United States has lived in the age of free security from the beginning of the 20th century until pretty recently. And by free security, I mean this, that there never was a time, or at least there were very rarely times, when somebody, President, Secretary, State, some of the outside, proposed an initiative, some aspect of foreign policy, and ahead of time, people said, no, that's going to be too expensive, we can't do it. No, the general feeling was, if it needs to be done, we will find the way to pay for it. Now, we're running up, I think, to the end of that era. And there will come a time when people will ask, okay, do we want a war against Syria? Do we want a war against Iran? Or, because now that we know what the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq have caused, I think there will be much more of, we're going to pay attention to this. I drew the analogy to medical insurance or various kinds of insurance. You know, if you have medical insurance, you don't ask what a procedure is going to cost. If somebody says, okay, you need to get this procedure done, you just go and do it, and it's going to be taken care of. We're running beyond that, and so we're no longer going to have the kind of insurance policy approach to foreign policy. People will ask ahead of time, and they will say, can we really afford that? And I'm going to suggest that what's going to happen is that Americans, Americans are not going to lose their ambition regarding what the country, what this country means to the world. Except they will shift back in the direction of the idea that what this country can deliver to the world is this good example of democracy working well at home. And those people who are going to make that argument will say, you know, where we went wrong, where we screwed up, was ignoring the device, the advice of John Quincy Adams, who said, once we go out on this approach of becoming the vindicator of other people's interests, then we lose our democratic soul at home. And people could talk about the device of politics and so on. Now, so it's going to look like the United States will be retreating from world affairs. But I would suggest that there is something to this exemplarist approach. And I will give you just one data point. And you can take that one data point for whatever one data point might be worth. And that is that when John Quincy Adams made this, made this statement about what the American role should be, and this was in the 1820s, there was basically one democracy in the world. You know, when Alexei de Tocqueville was looking to explain democracy, he came to America. So there's no place else to go to look at a democracy. Mm -hmm. How many democracies are there today? Well, it depends on how you count them, but a uh, hundred or so, maybe more. Okay. And how did all those democracies come into being? Oh, one could argue that the U.S. Army gave an assist to German democracy, Japanese democracy. But I would make the argument that in fact democracy caught on because other people in other countries wanted to be like the United States, not in the sense of having the biggest army, not in the sense of spending the most on the military, but on sharing or adopting American values. So, at least in that one, on that one measure, the exemplarist point of view seems to have worked out pretty well. I'll stop there. Maybe have time for a few questions? Objections?